stay with us. Different song and different lyrics. Enjoy. On fait 30 secondes de nage. Back it's 206 on RTCI and my guest is Mr. Shalav, the head of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and Dr. Tarak Shemiti. Welcome back again. Thank you very much. So I've just received dozens of emails on, and Facebook messages I'm normally supposed to start with Tunisia because this is the country where you are based. But my first question is actually about Syria as um, you were coordinator of the Commission of Inquiry on Syria in 2011. Are you concerned about human rights abuse and the crimes committed in Syria? And how does the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights Office react to the crisis in Syria? Of course, I'm representative in Tunisia, but I'll answer your, your question about Syria. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, okay. You should know that, uh, of course, we are very concerned about the human rights situation in Syria. Mm -hmm. And uh, the solution to this are threefold. There is one which is human rights, mm -hmm. one is purely humanitarian, and mm -hmm. the third one is a political one. So our, uh, ans our answer about the human rights situation. Mm -hmm. What concerns us are that there are grave human rights violations and there are victims. There are a lot of victims. Uh, when I started the Commission of Inquiry, there were about 3,000 uh, mm -hmm. people who were dead, both from the security forces and civilians. And uh, I hear now that there are more than 30,000. And every day hundreds of people are dying. So, of course, uh, one should find a solution, and I say, as I said, it's not only human rights, but it's also a political solution. Mm -hmm. And that's what Lagda uh, Ibrahim is doing mm -hmm. on the political side. On our side, we try to document the human rights situations which are happening, mm -hmm. and these include uh, extrajudicial killings, torture, rape, and others, mm -hmm. and also to establish the responsibilities. And I think this is a very important part of our work, to seek accountability for these crimes which have been committed. Here I should say that uh, crimes have been committed by both sides in the conflict, mm -hmm. but the scale and the proportion is not comparable, of course. On one side you have uh, a state machine with army which is uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of soldiers and security forces. Mm -hmm. But we are very concerned of this escalation of the conflict because if in the beginning of the conflict uh, demonstrations were uh, largely peaceful and uh, uh, most of the victims were civilians, mm -hmm. we see now that uh, the context has changed. Do you think there's a way out for the crisis in Syria? I'll repeat myself, the conflict should stop. Mm -hmm. We don't want any more victims and I think the solutions can be only political. Mm -hmm. Okay, so special procedures is a general name given to the mechanisms established by the Human Rights Council to address either specific country situations or thematic issues in all parts of the world. Which procedures do you usually follow when dealing with human rights abuses in countries like Tunisia before uh, and after the revolution as well? I will start first to say that uh, Tunisia is a transition period, mm -hmm. which is very obvious to all, but I want to reiterate that it's a historic moment. Mm -hmm. And in this moment of transition, and in order that it be successful, special procedures play a very important role. When we talk about special procedures, these are independent experts which are nominated by the Human Rights Council. We have certain expertise. To give you some 
examples. There is a special rapporteur on torture, there is a special rapporteur on human rights defenders, mm -hmm. there is a working group on uh, discrimination of women in law and practice. So what we try to do is to facilitate their visit to Tunisia. They meet with uh, both governments, state authorities, mm -hmm. but also with civil society, and they try to assist the country in moving ahead. And in this moment, as you know, there is a constitution drafting and several legislations related to human rights. So I think that their advice is crucial in this moment. Mm -hmm. The last visit that we had was the Special Rapporteur on Transitional Justice. And if you want, I can expand a little bit more on this. Yes, but uh, uh, this is one of the important areas mm -hmm. in which we work. Uh, what is basically the role of your team? You have about 15 members here at your office in Tunis. Where is the role of people like Dr. Tarciniti? Our role is to accompany the state and civil society in this transition period. Mm -hmm. And we hope that this will be a successful transition. So in my office I have about 15 staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can maybe divide their, their role in two main uh, areas. One is monitoring of human rights mm -hmm. violations. So mm -hmm. this is all work which is looking or whether there are violations in the country, in the regions. We don't stay only in Tunis. Oh, really? You we, work in the regions as well? We work in all regions of the country. Uh, my colleague Tarek uh, Shaniti uh, is working mainly uh, in the area of uh, Sidi Bouzid, uh, Gafsa, in the interior of the country, which uh, I should say it's uh, what we hear, it's uh, some regions which were marginalized and, uh, and need to be listened to. Mm -hmm. So this is one part, uh, as I said, monitoring of human rights violations, but also very important part is that we don't only criticize or monitor what is happening, but we try to assist and to build the capacity of the state authorities, of governors, of, uh, of um, local civil society organizations. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of local civil, civil society organizations which were created in the last <coughs> 18 months. And uh, these are young people with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of goodwill, and mm -hmm. we think that uh, they need our support. Uh, Dr. Tarak Shiniti, how do you describe or evaluate your experience with the UN Human Rights Office in Tunis and with Mr. Uh, Chalet? Uh, I think it's a very positive experience and it's a great privilege to be part of uh, this whole process of uh, building the capacity of the country to promote and protect human rights during this transition period. Uh, and as, uh, as Mr. Dimitri Shalat said, uh, we, we do this uh, with people directly. We go mm -hmm. and see them wherever they are mm -hmm. uh, to offer our advice, uh, to offer our technical expertise uh, in areas which might uh, be useful to them. Uh, and one of the things we have uh, done so far is to um, uh, liaise with uh, NGOs and civil society organizations in general which have place themselves broadly under the umbrella of development so far mm -hmm. to try and change a bit the uh, discourse to something that is more uh, human rights uh, oriented. It's very uh, important for them to embrace this new way of thinking about the development problems. It's not just about economic development, as revolution has showed us. Mm -hmm. It's also about what sorts of rights people can legitimately uh, and legally claim uh, when, when, they, uh, w when they ask for, for this uh, right to development. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, it's a huge task uh, and I'm really happy that we are uh, part of this uh, transition uh, process and uh, uh, so far we have uh, been also impressed by the, uh, uh, the uh, willingness of uh, civil society organizations to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to engage in, in this direction of human rights. It's, mm -hmm. uh, there's a huge um, consciousness and awareness about human rights in, in the interior regions in particular. Perhaps the, the fact that they have been marginalized for so, so long has uh, developed a sense of sharp understanding of, of these rights that you cannot perhaps find, find in big cities. Mr. Chalabon, I ask you about the priorities of the uh, UN Human Rights Office in Tunis because we can't talk about human rights without um, speaking about education, about, uh, about um, women's rights and, uh, and different rights in Tunisia. What is your priority? What is your vision? Because 
working in Tunisia after the revolution is is different from the same place uh, two or three years ago? Thank you very much for this question. You are asking what our priorities are, uh, and this is a difficult choice uh, because, yeah, as you know, uh, uh, there's so many challenges uh, in Tunisia, mm -hmm. and of course, uh, there, there are rights which are political and civil rights, such as freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association, uh, rule of law, but on the other side, mm -hmm. uh, as uh, uh, Mr. Shiniti said, uh, the revolution was uh, the demand of the revolution was about economic and social rights. Mm -hmm. So, so we try to to divide our work in these two main areas, uh, and uh, to simplify, I would say, rule of law, uh, to build strong institutions which uh, ensure respect for human rights. Mm -hmm. work uh, in the reform of the security sector, work in the area of transitional justice. Uh, let's not forget also the constitution, which would uh, be the basis of mm -hmm. uh, really the, the fundamental basis of all what will happen in the next years here uh, uh, in Tunisia. And on the other side, uh, we try not to forget mm -hmm. uh, exactly the rights that you mentioned, right to education, right to health, mm -hmm. uh, right to work. This is uh, a major problem and, uh, and also rights of groups such as women, children, other groups. I would mention here people living with HIV AIDS, uh, people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So, as you can see, uh, it's a lot of work, but I should say that we are not alone in this work. Uh, we, we are part of the United Nations, we work with our colleagues uh, of UNICEF, mm -hmm. for example, for the rights of the child, we work with uh, UNESCO on education, we work with the um, United Nations Development Program on uh, development issues and so forth. I'll ask you in about four minutes about uh, the challenge of building strong institutions at this transitional stage. We'll be back in about four minutes, so stay tuned. Stay with us. From the Troubles of My Life by Greek David. Welcome back, it's 2.20 on HTC and my guests are Mr. Chaleb from the UN Human Rights uh, Office here in Tunis and Mr. Tarak Shiniti. I would, just, I would just ask you a question about the, uh, the challenge, the challenge of building strong institutions at this transitional stage. Your question uh, touches on something very essential. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned in the beginning, uh, there is a constitution drafting in which you have most of the human rights enumerated. Uh, Tunisia is part of uh, the major human rights conventions as well, mm -hmm. ratified and signed by, by Tunisia. But how to respect these rights? I think this can be done only through strong cons uh, institutions, but only, something I want to stress, independent institutions. Independent institutions, yeah. To give you one example, uh, we talked about transitional justice. Mm -hmm. After uh, long consultations with civil society, uh, different actors, there is a draft law which is now before the National Constituent Assembly. Mm -hmm. This law foresees the creation of a Truth and Dignity Commission which will deal with the transitional justice process. Mm -hmm. And of course, here the main problem is to have an independent institution yeah. which has the knowledge and knowledge also of the best 
experiences in many other countries. Mm -hmm. Tunisia has a unique experience, but also it's very similar yeah. to, to other countries. So we see our role to support the building of such uh, constitutions, uh, such institutions. So, so that's, uh, you see, the objective of all this process is not only to build institutions, mm -hmm. it's also to reach an objective which is reconciliation. And each of these institutions has an uh, objective to reach, uh, to reach uh, uh, some kind of consensus between state authorities and civil society if we want that the transition in mm -hmm. Tunisia succeeds. You have experience in different countries. Do you think it's possible to reach, uh, the, um, to reach that level of expertise and that level of, um, of knowledge in order to, uh, to, to forget about the past and to move forward and to, to say, okay, we turn the page and let's move forward? The transitional justice process has four pillars. One of them is seeking the truth. One cannot t turn the page before knowing what What's has happened. happened. Yeah. <laughs> the second one is accountability. People who have committed grave human rights violations should mm -hmm. be prosecuted. The third part is what we call reparations, reparations. and mm -hmm. compensations for the victims. Because let's not forget that the whole process is centered on the victims of human rights violations. Mm -hmm. So these reparations, they could be financial, but also can be symbolic. And the last part, I think that is very important, is to build strong institutions mm -hmm. which will guarantee non-repetition of human rights violations in the past in this context building a strong security sector mm -hmm. is essential but this security sector should respect human rights. I want to talk about the third point which is reparation and compensation. Do you know that many political parties and MPs from the National Constituent Assembly are against the idea of uh, compensating the former victims of the, um, of the Ben Ali regime? Uh, can we talk about economy while speaking about, uh, about compensations? We are talking about justice. Mm -hmm. That's in the name of transitional <laughs> justice. I think that uh, here the main issue, as I said, is victims. It has yes. to be centered mm -hmm. on the victims. And I'm not talking here about group of victims, mm -hmm. which are victims uh, during the Ben Ali regime mm -hmm. or, or even earlier because this process is uh, supposed earlier? to start as of uh, 1955. Really? So I think that this process should lead to reconciliation and not to division, mm -hmm. not to put against each other different groups of people or victims. It's about all victims who have suffered torture, uh, prolonged detention, and so forth, grave human rights violations, they should be considered as deserving compensation. And my experience, and the experience in many other countries, shows that victims not always want financial compensation. Yeah, symbolic. They want to know the truth. Mm -hmm. they, they know that this is acknowledged, that uh, it could be memorial which is built for, for these victims, it could be testimonies which are uh, printed, uh, that their suffering is known mm -hmm. and acknowledged. So, it's not always about financial reparation. Okay, Tarak Suniti, are you for financial reparation? You're an expert. <laughs> Well, well, financial reparation is part of it, but uh, I think the most important thing is to listen to, to whether it has a stake in this process, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the victims essentially, and mm -hmm. I'm happy that there is already a national consultation process which is underway, it, uh, it happened uh, in September and October, and I, I think it's, it's a very good start uh, to a larger process mm -hmm. whereby you would hear everyone 
about what they expect from the process and how things can uh, can be made to uh, last. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not it's, it's transitional justice does not take a few months. It doesn't take a few years. It's something that that is supposed to build for a new state of things, a, a democratic state, a a, a, a peaceful and fair society. Mm -hmm. So it, it takes time, and some countries have indeed taken decades to, to go through it. But we, we don't have to assume that it is going to take a, a certain amount of time. We just mm -hmm. have to do things the, the right way. And the right way is to is really to engage everyone uh, and not to assume that financial reparation only can solve uh, problems or can make these people satis be sa feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's very important to, to know exactly what happened and to hear the versions of also people who were uh, we were part of, uh, of, the, of the system. Of, the, of, the, of course, I mean, mm -hmm. these people also have things to uh, to say. They have their part of the truth that, that should be known to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's important to uh, to have this uh, space where all views can be expressed, uh, and then to let society decide how what so, what sort of uh, settlement uh, it, it wants it wants to reach. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dimitri Shalev, in January 2010, the Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms, while countering terrorism, conducted a visit to Tunisia. It's difficult to understand the logic of balance between protecting human rights and countering terrorism in the Middle East region. You know there's a potential rise of ACME or Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb region. How do you advise countries on human rights issues when there's a potential threat? It's difficult to find to, to, to find this balance. It's nearly impossible in some countries. Our approach is very principled. And uh, for example, torture is mm -hmm. not acceptable in any circumstances. No matter what is the issue. And mm -hmm. in the context of counter-terrorism there there was some debate on this. But this is a not derogable right of every human being. How do you deal with the practical sides of the issue? Uh, how do you reconcile human rights of people mm -hmm. and the security of the state, the citizens, because uh, everybody has also the right to life and uh, personal security? This is exactly the role of our independent uh, experts that uh, that we started our talk uh, in the beginning mm -hmm. and one of them uh, was here who submitted a report uh, with uh, concrete recommendations to the Tunisian authorities mm -hmm. and I think uh, this is an issue which is very important but uh, uh, should, uh, should be again centered on the rights of individuals. Mm -hmm. so two Tunisians who have been described by local media as Salafists died this month of hunger strike. They were arrested in September after the, uh, the attack on the US Embassy in Tunis. There are now more than 100 hunger strikers in Tunisian uh, jail. Some claim they didn't participate in the attack on the embassy and four are in a critical uh, condition. Uh, is your office aware of the situation of the detainees? Is it in a way your role? or? Yes, of course. I have to, we enjoy excellent cooperation with the Tunisian authorities and in mm -hmm. particular with the Ministry of Justice which is responsible for, for prisons and prison administration mm -hmm. and yes, of course we are following the situation. We visit uh, regularly all prisons in Tunisia and mm -hmm. we come with concrete recommendations to the, to the authorities. Now, on your concrete uh, question about, about uh, the Salafists, we respect their right to expression, freedom of expression. Peaceful. Peaceful, obviously. And uh, we think that they have uh, the same rights as all detainees. The problem in Tunisian prisons mm -hmm is partly a problem of a long pre-trial detention. The majority of the prison population uh, in Tunisian prisons uh, is awaiting yeah, for a trial, trial and uh, judicial proceedings to, to be completed. 
I think that uh, that's my answer. I think that uh, mm -hmm. uh, all people should uh, be equal before the law and the judicial system should improve its efficiency mm -hmm. to deal with such cases. And that's why we are here, not only us, as you know, the other actors, as the European uh, Union, mm -hmm. other bilateral uh, actors, uh, United Nations, we are trying to strengthen and hopefully improve the uh, judicial system. Tarkhsunit, did you have the same vision as Mr. Dimitri Chalev concerning the, uh, the rise of Salafism in Tunisia? This is according to local media, it's not my turn. Uh, well, I mean, we, uh, as he rightly said, uh, everyone should be treated equally, regardless of their political inclination. Mm -hmm. So everyone is entitled to the same right to free speech and the same right to express that, whatever opinion they have, mm -hmm. uh, peacefully. Uh, so th the issue is not the rise of, uh, of Salafism in Tunisia. The issue is whether people's rights are fulfilled and respected uh, and promoted all the time. Uh, regardless of who they are. This is the issue in, in Tunisia in the transition and I think it's important that we focus on this particular issue of how to make sure that the authorities uh, respect their commitment uh, to, to human rights regardless of who uh, who these rights concern. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is our role as, as the UN Human Rights uh, Agency. Uh, it's, uh, it's to really build the capacity of uh, the government to uh, fulfill the obligations, which are legal obligations, it's not just an ethical obligation, mm -hmm. it's also by international law, they're supposed to respect and promote and fulfill those rights at all time. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, this is where we come in, this is our exact role. Let's listen to Because I Love You by Céline Dion, we'll be back after the news update. <laughs> On the fire, and it burns like me for you tomorrow. Save tonight by Eagle Eye Cherry. Welcome back. It's 241 on RTCI. And we are moving to the situation of human rights in Tunisia. Mr. Chalav, Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, have recently criticized human rights abuses in Tunisia as head of the office of the United Nations High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights in Tunis. Do you have the same feeling, or this, is this an exaggerated evaluation of the situation in our country? The Office of the High Commission for Human Rights here in Tunisia mm -hmm. has this role also to criticize. But this is a friendly and constructive uh, <laughs> criticism. As I said, it's coupled also with assistance to the authorities mm -hmm. and advice how they better protect and respect human rights. So when we are talking about uh, uh, abuses or human rights violations, yes, uh, they exist. Mm -hmm. I cannot say, though, that they are systematic. I'll give you one example. Security forces, mm -hmm. reforms. Yeah. We have conducted trainings mm -hmm. on human rights. 6,000 officers? I mean, this is a basic training for, mm -hmm. for about 6,000 new recruits. Mm -hmm. But also, we have uh, conducted trainings for trainers who are Tunisians and who would ensure that our training is not just punctual and ad hoc, but mm -hmm. it would be sustainable. Now, we don't think that this is enough, the training only. So that's why we have worked also on legislation of use of excessive force, mm -hmm. on standard operating procedures for every police officer or security officer. So he applies in his daily work these principles of human rights. So again, yes, there are some human rights violations. Mm -hmm. We are critical about this. But we go beyond this. We want to establish a climate of confidence between 
all parts of the security forces mm -hmm. and the Tunisian population because that's the only way that this transition would succeed. But, but you have trained 6,000 new recruits. What about the old ones? Is it too late for them to talk about human rights? <laughs> this question is for, <laughs> for, the, for the two guys. <laughs> okay, again, I come back to the beginning of our conversations. <laughs> we have priorities and this is we, the, we cannot do everything. This but, is the new media after the revolution. <laughs> but again, <laughs> asking the right questions. <laughs> we are not the only ones. Huh? Yeah. There, there are other, other partners who, who are doing uh, uh, this. And mm -hmm. we, of course, coordinate our work uh, in this area. When you, you, I'll tell you because you're a journalist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a special training which is conducted by, by colleagues uh, from UNESCO is how the police should respect the rights of journalists. We have modules which are... Uh, you can invite on women. to talk about this topic. <laughs> on women rights. Uh? Yeah. Uh, we haven't talked uh, about women uh, mm -hmm. so far. And uh, I have to mention that now we're in the middle of a campaign, 16 days of... Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, okay. activism of uh, violence, I mean against violence against women mm -hmm. and uh, of course we have modules on this part so there, there are many actors in this area mm -hmm. what we want to achieve is ownership by the national authorities and coordination which exists in this area mm -hmm. so all these interventions go uh, in the same direction but also they are complementary. Mm -hmm. Which challenges have you faced while training 6,000 6, new recruits from the Interior Ministry? It's extremely interesting uh, these trainings because uh, they, they also generate a lot of debate on the issues of the day. Mm -hmm. So this is not uh, a training, as you can imagine, that uh, we tell them these are the norms, the conventions, these are the mm -hmm. uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What we try is to be very practical. We tell them when you're in such a situation, how do you write? How do you protect uh, the right of the person? How you talk about uh, with uh, any Tunisian citizen? Mm -hmm. And uh, there is another part of the whole story, this is the, uh, how the Tunisian population also relates to the security yeah. forces. Mm -hmm. so, so what we are trying also is to, uh, to sensibilize and to Tunisians to work with civil society. As I said, we cannot do everything, yeah. but uh, we work <coughs> with civil society on this principle of situante. So it's uh, like a civic education, mm -hmm. which uh, has to exist uh, uh, in order that uh, we move forward. Tarak Shani, do you believe it's it's easy to change the mentality of police officers and and and, uh, and the citizens as well? Uh, it's not just about mentality. I think any institutional change must take time anyway. It's uh, I don't uh, cannot think of any institution that wants to change itself from within. twenty-four hours. And of course, it, these things take time. Mm -hmm. uh, and the sort of uh, uh, things we have done with the ministry so far are mm -hmm. very positive. I mean, there's a, there, there's a, a commitment to uh, changing the way police officers relate to the population mm -hmm. and the way uh, the, this notion of security is understood within a democratic frame. Uh, so we're building on that. Mm -hmm. um, now, of course, there is also the issue of how the population perceives police and I can I can think of a few organizations which are already working on that in civil society mm -hmm. uh, and I think it is a very uh, encouraging thing that civil society is already aware of the necessity for security sector reform to take place and for it to engage with it uh, but of course this being a very sensitive uh, sector that is the backbone of the country uh, it's it's perhaps more difficult for uh, civil society to work on this particular issue, uh, uh, like other issues that relate uh, perhaps to other areas of, uh, of, of society or, or the economy. Um, but I think things are moving forward mm -hmm. in general. Tarak and Mr. Chalev will have a short break with one minute with Boys on Picture of Love and we'll be back. Stay with us.
Picture of Love, Welcome Back by, by Boyzone. It's 2.51 on RTCI and we are talking about human rights in Tunisia. My guests are Mr. Chalef uh, from the UN Human Rights Office and Mr. Tarak Shaniti. Mr. Chalef, my question is about uh, the, the priority of your office, which is pursuing economic, social and cultural rights and combating inequalities and poverty. How do you concretely operate in order to reach those goals? And you can also talk about uh, the the uh, the uh, the increase uh, of ratifications of international human rights mechanisms. I I mentioned in the beginning that uh, Tunisia has ratified most of the uh, human rights uh, treaties. One of them mm -hmm. is the Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Mm -hmm. So I'll link this to to your first question about how we work. Uh, on the issue of economic and social rights. Again, we do some prioritization. For us, there are three main economic and social rights that we consider important. Mm -hmm. These are the right to work, the right to education, and the right to health. So, our first objective is to monitor how these human rights are uh, implemented or respected and again uh, uh, in in this particular monitoring we try to go in the interior of the countries because mm -hmm. there is this disparity uh, between regions that I talked earlier. Now the state has also obligation to report mm -hmm. under this covenant on economic, social and cult cultural rights how the state promotes and respects these rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tunisia has not reported to the Committee on Economic Social Rights for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we are trying first to accompany the government in collecting data and also presenting the situation on economic and social rights. Uh, we've conducted a training for 20 ministries uh, on this area. We have a plan of uh, follow-up for the next six months. Mm -hmm. And we also try to associate civil society. Uh, this area is, uh, is very broad, very important. And again, we see uh, our role uh, as part of a whole group of actors. Mm -hmm. uh, whole process. Uh, among of them UNDP mm -hmm. uh, and other development uh, actors. Which challenges are you facing in Tunisia or are we living in a, in a perfect land without trouble and human rights abuses as, as some politicians have recently claimed? 